And Jesse, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, let me go ahead and start sharing out my screen real quick. All right. So remember, you are all on mute. So if you notice there is a participants panel in the WebEx, you can always click that little red microphone to unmute if you have an urgent question. Otherwise, we'll try and reserve a few minutes at the end of the call for some other questions as we uh, go along here. So uh, what I, where I'd like to begin is we're going to start by talking about the concept of an envelope. Now, analogous to a real-life envelope, if you think about what that is, it's a container where it probably contains a document that's been addressed to you that when you open the envelope, you pull it out, uh, unravel it, and you sign it. Same concept in DocuSign. The only difference is that this is an electronic representation that we call an envelope. So that's your single transaction that you send documents out for signature. So that's what I'm going to be taking you through today is creating that single transaction where you can send one or many documents to one or many recipients. And what I, where I like to begin <clears throat> excuse me, is actually just going very, very quickly, showing you a quick five-minute demo of how to send an envelope, sign a document. And I'm going to go very, very quickly. Don't worry, we're going to spend the rest of the time kind of rewinding, and I'm going to go much slower through some of the explanations and how I did what I did. So let's go ahead and click on this new button, send an envelope. I'm going to go ahead and upload a document or two. I will then proceed to add in a recipient that I want interacting and signing the document. You can have more than one. I'm just going to put in one for starters. Add in a subject line. It sounds like someone just went off mute. If you can please mute yourself. Thank you very much. So we'll put in a subject line to <clears throat> capture their attention. We go on to the next screen. And this is where I start placing DocuSign fields for them to interact with. In this example, I'm just going to put a signature and a date and send. So now I have essentially created an envelope. It can be much more complex than that. We'll come back, like I said, for more explanation here in just a bit. And when I send it, I arrive here on my Manage tab where I can now track that transaction. But what happens when we send an envelope is an email is delivered to the recipient, as we see here, where when they click on it, they have a brief message. You can have a customized set of instructions in here if you desire. But when they click Review Document, this is going to keep them in their browser, and now we're going into what we call a secure signing ceremony. I have to agree to sign electronically first. But now, otherwise, I'm viewing the document in my browser in a secure signing ceremony where now I can sign it with my electronic signature. If I've never signed with DocuSign before, I can upload a signature. I can draw a signature. I can also select a predetermined style if I like. So maybe I'll just pick this one since I'm on a desktop. It's easier to pick that with my mouse. Click Adopt and Sign. It stamps my signature there. And then I finish by clicking the Finish button. This is just if I wanted to log in and save a copy in my account. But as soon as everyone is done signing, the nice thing is, is that we send an email notification now that where we prepend the word completed. So in this completed notification, I can click on View Completed Document. It keeps me in my browser, opens up this session, where now I'm viewing the final copy, where I could zoom in or out. I can click this Download arrow, and I could download the document as a PDF. Or I could even print it straight to my printer. And if I scroll down, you'll see that I'm viewing the final signed copy. So very, very easy to use DocuSign in terms of being a sender or if you're a recipient slash signer, being asked to do something on a document. Okay. So what I like to do now is kind of rewind, and I like to just go through a much more uh, thorough process of explaining all the different things that you can do when you're creating an envelope. And we're going to talk about templates, power forms, reporting, user preferences. We'll talk, uh, we'll I'll kind of touch on those throughout the call just very, very gently, uh, very lightly rather. Um, and then in future sessions, we'll go much more in depth on topics like templates where it's essentially pre-built envelopes that make it much quicker to send envelopes. And if we have time, I'll show you an example of a template at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this new button again. And just to walk you through some of the options here, 
I can send an envelope. This is used if I want to send a transaction to other individuals to sign. So someone other than just my signature. Now, as an employee, let's just say HR or someone sends you a document, no one else needs to sign it, and they just send it to you via email as like an attachment, like a PDF or something. And you just simply want to sign it, but you don't want to print it, wet sign it, scan it, upload it back. Instead, hey, I have a DocuSign account. Why can't I just apply my electronic signature? You can choose sign a document, and that would mean that you're signing it with your own electronic signature using the credentials you're currently logged in as. You would not be routing it to anybody else. And then, of course, we're going to talk about templates later. Those are essentially, again, pre-built envelopes. And then power forms, which are more self-service envelopes, where someone can click on a link on your website, sign a document through DocuSign, all without you having to go through and send an envelope to them. So that will be more so in the template session where we focus on templates and power forms together. So we're going to keep this uh, course central to creating envelopes. So I'm going to click Send an Envelope one more time. And let's walk through some of these options. So when I click the Upload button, this is uploading the documents from my local computer or connected network drive. Using a template, I could choose a pre-built template where if I go ahead and say if I want to send out like a PTO request form or maybe it's a contract of some type, I can go ahead and click Add. And you can see it automatically adds my document, my recipient workflow where I can simply address the recipients, and all the work has already been pre-built for me. I have a unique subject line, some canned messaging with some instructions. And when I go on to the next page, if I go on down here to page 3, we can see those DocuSign fields are already placed in advance. So that's just a good uh, example real quick of uh, a template. So let me go back here, set an envelope. And then the other option that you may see in your account is this Get From Cloud. Now depending upon um, your university and whether or not they're going to allow you to upload from one of these uh, third-party uh, cloud repositories is up to them. But if you do see this option, you may see some of these four options here. So for instance, if they're allowing you to upload the document from Box or Google Drive, if I click on one of these services, it's going to ask me for my own personal user credentials. Now this isn't going to save a copy of the signed document back to this location where I'm pulling it from. This is simply just another way of pulling in the document that you want to send out for signature because maybe it's sitting in the cloud and you want to pull it in from there. Instead of having to go to Box, save it to your hard drive, and then upload it from your hard drive. So it's trying to save you a few steps. I'm going to go ahead and just click Upload from my computer again. And the types of documents you can upload can be PDFs, Word documents, uh, Excel files, uh, PowerPoints, it could even be image files. So if you have scanned documents that are saved as JPEGs or PNGs, etc. The only file types that we don't accept would be like code-based malicious files or anything that could be like executable files, things of that nature. But if it's a major document file type, more than likely we accept it. And we can add in more than one document. So for example, let me add in maybe some terms and conditions here along with maybe let me pick a couple here. So you can see I have a variety, two Word documents and a PDF. You can mix and match. When I click Open, it's going to attempt to upload all three. As soon as it finishes uploading, cool. So now these documents are going to appear in the order as they appear here to, the, to your recipient from left to right. But as you saw in the signing experience, it, it shows from top to bottom. But this is going to be the order that they, that they see it from left to right. So if I needed, say, this document to come first, I can just simply hover over it, click on it, drag it over, and reorder the documents however I'd like. And if I've uploaded one too many forms, I can go ahead and click on this little X, and I can go ahead and delete them. Okay, so very easy to add documents and reposition them however you like. Now the next step is adding recipients. Now recipient is a very generic term. It just means you're an individual receiving the envelope. But it doesn't necessarily specify your action. And I'm going to uh, clarify that here in just a moment. But the first step is to add recipients. Who needs to be involved in this transaction? So I showed you a pretty simplistic example just a minute ago where I signed as one signer. But what if you have multiple? 
example, let's set up a more advanced uh, recipient routing order. So I can go ahead and click in here. Let's add the signer. And if I need to add more than one recipient, I'll click this little gray button right below it. Let's add in the signer. Add another recipient. And let's just say this last person is a carbon copy. I don't need them signing, but I simply want to get a copy. So let's go ahead and add in someone from HR. Maybe they need to get a copy. OK. So now I have three recipients in my workflow. Now there's nothing here that's specifying who's going to sign first, second, or last. Uh, maybe besides you uh, seeing someone's name before the others. But that's simply the order that we added the recipients. So this right here is what we call parallel routing or parallel signing, where we'd be asking all of these individuals to be potentially viewing or signing the document simultaneously. That may or may not be what your use case calls for. That's really up to you. But we do also have sequential routing, meaning we could make it so Amanda signs first. Only after she signs will we then notify Steve. After Steve signs and completes his action, then we notify Derek. So it's a very step-by-step -step strict workflow, and you can even mix and match parallel and sequential routing. So what I mean by that is if you take a look at this little signing order link, it's a little diagram that gives you a good visual to show you in position one here in the routing order, all three of these individuals are side by side, meaning they're going to get the document simultaneously. If I click on this little checkbox right here, set signing order, that's where I can sequence my recipients however I'd like. So let's just say in this workflow, Amanda signs first, then Steve, then Derek. If I click on the signing order again, you'll actually see it update in real time. So now we have three different routing order positions, so the workflow is only going to progress after each person completes their action until ultimately the final person signs and then the envelope is completed. Now, I did mention you can mix and match. So let's just say maybe I want Amanda and Steve signing simultaneously, and then Derek is the final signer. Notice how the numbers aren't in a strict sequence, and that's okay. All DocuSign cares about is what number is lower than the next, because we're just going to follow that sequence. So really, I can make this person number 30. It doesn't matter. And when I click on the signing order diagram, you'll see here how I'm the sender. We have two people in parallel. Then after both people are done signing, it'll then go here to the next person and then be completed. So I'm going to actually update this a little bit. Okay. So now the next part is determining what is the recipient's action type. Like I mentioned, being the, a recipient is just a rather vague term. just means you're receiving the envelope. So what's your action? What is your role in, the, in this process? That's where we designate the action type here in this drop-down menu. By default, you'll notice it says needs to sign. But if I click on it, this is where I can choose, okay, do I want this person being a host for an in-signing ceremony or in-person signing ceremony, meaning uh, the, maybe the signer is standing face-to-face -face with me. And instead of them pulling up the document like you saw uh, through their own email and clicking the link signing on their device, maybe as a host, they're standing face to face, I want to pull up the document on my tablet or my laptop and have them sign on my company device. You've probably experienced that like in an in-person signing ceremony or a session where if you've been at the bank recently or a cell phone store or a kiosk, more than likely they've swiveled a device around for your signature. When you're done, they take back possession of that device. That's a great example of a hosted signing ceremony that we call an in-person signing. We also have a CC, which you're probably familiar with from the email world. Right? You can carbon copy individuals. They don't have any firm action. They don't have to reply. They don't have to do anything on the document. It's view only access. And then we have these other advanced recipient role types. I don't go over these in depth on this DocuSign 101 session. We're trying to keep things a, a little bit more high level today, uh, not to uh, overwhelm you. <laughs> uh, but in the template training, I do go a bit more in depth on these advanced recipient roles. These are generally used when you have more ambiguous workflows. Like for example, maybe you know who the first signer is, but you don't know who signer two will be until you get the data from signer one. 
maybe depending upon dollar amounts they choose on the document or the different elections or data they provide, maybe that'll inform as to who the next approver needs to be. And so we'll talk more about those types of workflows in, in that more advanced session. So like I mentioned in my workflow here, I want this third person to be a carbon copy, so I'm going to change this from needs to sign to receives a copy. Now the other nice thing to know about recipients is that as soon as the envelope is completed, everyone involved, including the sender, gets a completed notification, like you saw when I did my quick demo at the very beginning of this session. So in this case, if you're the sender, you don't have to carbon copy yourself. You would only just want to carbon copy anyone else additional above and beyond these uh, signers and the sender that might need to receive a copy. Now under this More dropdown, we can add some additional uh, settings to make the document a little bit more, or sorry, the envelope a bit more clear, maybe add some instructions via a private message. Or I can even add authentication to make the, the link in that email more secure. Because as you saw, when I sent the envelope, I clicked on a link and I was able to view and sign the document without being challenged. But if you're sending documents that have personally identifiable information, whether that be street addresses, phone numbers, dates of birth, social security numbers, credit card numbers, etc., that's all PII data. So you would want to make sure that you protect that link behind some form of recipient authentication. And you'll want to defer to your business team as to which one of these authentication methods that you'd want to use, because uh, there are some that have a per transactional fee. So for instance, if I click on Add Access Authentication, I could choose from an access code or some of these others. Now notice there is a dollar sign. This will tell you visually which ones will incur a per transactional fee. But depending upon the, the level of data and how sensitive the data, you may want to leverage one of these more advanced uh, authentication methods depending upon the type of data you're working with. The more sensitive the data, the more strict authentication you'll want to use. Something like access code is always free of charge. The catch with the access code, though, is that you, the sender, would have to create the access code. So if I click right here, I can come up with an access code that I would want this person entering. Now this access code would not be communicated to the recipient from DocuSign. We're not going to put it in the email notification next to the link because that would kind of defeat the purpose if that person's email was hacked. So the access code would be something that either A, you verbally communicate to the recipient while you're on the phone with them, or if you want to give them a hint to make it something that's guessable. So let's just pretend this is like the last four of their social or uh, something like that. If I click on that More dropdown and then click Add Private Message, like the name implies, this message is private, only visible to this recipient. So now I wouldn't specify what the access code here is, never do that, but I would give maybe a hint. Maybe give them an example just so they can guess it in what format you're looking for. Okay, so when I send this envelope, you'll see what that looks like. All right, and then after we get done with recipients, if I go ahead and scroll on down here, now we add our messaging. Now I already, already showed you the private message up here, but down here, this is the message for all recipients. So everyone can view this subject line and body message. So email subject line, the, the real best practice tip that I'll give here is your email subject line becomes the name of your envelope. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Just like when you send emails out to other individuals from Outlook or Gmail or something, you're generally able to quickly tell what email you're receiving or being replied to based upon the subject line. Same thing here in DocuSign. Because we communicate via email notifications, as you see here, you want to make sure that you don't send out envelopes with identical subject lines every single time because that's just going to make it really difficult for you to track in your day-to-day -day workflow. So put something unique that's going to capture your attention so you know what this transaction is uh, pertaining to. Now the one thing that I can also do is I can 
change a, or apply a custom email language and message for each recipient. This is great if you have different recipients that might want to receive the email notification in their own native language. The things that we will not translate, though, are the document itself, the private message, and we cannot translate the subject line or the body message. So you might be asking yourself, well, what do we translate then? If I click back into an email notification here, all of the other standard verbiage, such as the sender name, sent you a document to review and sign, or this review document button, anything else that's standard out of the box, including all this other footer information, or even when I'm viewing the document in this other view here, this verbiage at the top of the screen, the button, all of that language would be translated for you. So what that means is let's just say maybe Amanda's wanting it in English, but Steve, maybe his native language is Spanish. So if I choose Spanish, now all the default verbiage would be sent to him in Spanish, but you'd still have to have the onus of translating the subject line yourself. But as you can see, you can translate it separately so that Amanda's subject line remains in English, and Steve's subject line would be in Spanish or whatever you translate it to. Now lastly on this page is some advanced options. And if I go ahead and click Edit, now I'm not going to go through a descriptor of each one of these settings. This is more just, again, high level, giving you an idea of what these advanced settings are. Because in your account, your admins are going to choose different settings that you may or may not be able to manipulate and edit, or they may lock down certain settings, depending upon the business requirements and use cases. So for instance, recipient privileges, this is going to allow or disallow your recipients to do certain things when they're signing the document. In my example here on my screen, do I want my recipients being able to print and sign on paper, or do I want to limit them to signing electronically? I generally like to disable that. Now, changing signing responsibility. If I send it to send an envelope here today to Carrie, and Carrie decides, you know what, I need my manager, Derek, to sign instead, that would allow Carrie to reassign the signing to her boss, Derek, as opposed to her being required to, to be mandated, or mandated to sign it. Right? She can pass it off to the most appropriate signer. Okay, so that's just a little bit about recipient privileges and how that would work. Now, you also saw at the very beginning, when I click send on the envelope, an email notification goes to the recipient's email. That's the first notification that's going to go out when it's that person's turn no matter what. But what the reminders are here is additional reminder notifications if that recipient didn't act on that first notification. So meaning they got it or maybe they didn't, maybe it went in their junk folder or spam folder and they weren't aware of it, or maybe they ignored it and a couple days have passed. Instead of you having the responsibility of having to take time out of your busy day to remind them and find out where it's at, you can apply automated reminders. So I could say send out reminders, and if they haven't signed the document after their first notification, let's just say maybe I'll wait two days, well then I'm going to send another reminder two days later. And if they still haven't signed two days later, this is where I can invoke a reoccurrence. So now this is where I can start bugging them a little bit more frequently, automatically. So I can say, well, I'm going to bug them now every two days then. Until they sign, then those reminders will stop, and then we will notify the next person. Okay, so we're only sending reminders to the person or persons that we're waiting on. And then we can have an expiration date. So just like a real-life contract, you're treating these documents, even though they're in electronic fashion, they're still executable and binding, and you want to treat them as such. So if you have expiration dates, uh, dates that you need to get documents back within a certain period of time, you want to make sure that you apply those same expiration settings here as well. So if you don't want to accept a document to come in four months later and you have to accept it, and you need to get it back within 30 days, and if it's not back, well then we need to renegotiate terms. I'd want to make sure that I reflect those same rules and business logic here in DocuSign. So I would set this expiration date to 30 days. And this gives you a date right here so you can make sure that it lines up with your calendar date that you're expecting. And this is calendar days, not business days. So this is telling me that on the 16th of next month, if I don't get both signatures, in this case from Steve and Amanda, then this envelope is going to automatically expire and void. And you have to start from the beginning. So you want to be careful. It is a fine balancing act. 
choosing the right expiration date. You don't want it sitting out there too long, but you don't want to set it too low because it could expire quickly, especially if your signers are busy and they haven't gotten around to reviewing the document and signing it. And I can also set an expiration warning. So if they haven't signed, and maybe I'll give them a five-day warning or a 10-day warning, that just gives them an extra buffer time, letting them know, hey, if you don't hurry up, this document is going to expire. And then I click Save. And then lastly, I'll click Next. And this takes me to what we call our tagging screen, where you're viewing your document and we're placing the necessary fields onto your document for each recipient. And we need to make sure that the fields are assigned to the correct individuals. So the first thing we do is we need to make sure that we have the correct recipient selected. And in the upper left-hand corner, if I click on this drop-down menu, you'll notice that there's color coding. So Amanda has a little yellow dot next to her name. Steve has a blue dot. If I click on Steve's name, notice how all those fields just turn blue. And if I click back on Amanda's name, they turn yellow. So this is very helpful. We do color coding, so you can very easily tell which fields on the document are assigned to whom. You can correct uh, who they're assigned to before you send it out. Because when that recipient clicks on the link, they're going to be filling out or interacting with the field that you have assigned to them. So let's just say on my document here, I want to have Amanda's full name put right there. I want her to sign, and I want to have it dated. Now, what if I need a secondary approval signature by my secondary party here? So I'll go ahead and click on Steve's name, and then I'll drag over the field for Steve. Now, I don't have a signature line form on here, so disregard that. But that's how that would be done. Now, what if there was a field here, like this full name field, that I accidentally put right here, and it's assigned to Steve. Well, notice every time I add a field, or if I click off a field and click back onto it, there's a property menu that keeps expanding over here on the right-hand side. Click off it, it goes away. Click back onto it, it returns. What this property menu allows you to do is adjust some of the properties or parameter settings for the fields that you have selected. So you'll notice one of those properties is the recipient that it's assigned to. So I can click on that field. Oops and I can reassign it to the correct recipient. The other way would be to delete the field, change the recipient, and you can just redrag it over. But what I was showing you is that if you already have the fields placed and you just accidentally assigned it to the wrong person, that's okay. Just select it and then change the assignment over here on the right-hand side, and then you'll see the colors update. Now, if, you're, uh, if you have visual impairments and you're colorblind, I, I've had some users in DocuSign where the color coding just doesn't make sense for them. So as you can tell, you can see who the field is assigned to just by looking on the right-hand side. So if I click on this blue field, I can see that it's assigned to Steve. I click on this yellow field, I can see it's assigned to Amanda. Okay. Now in the template training, we're going to go much more in-depth on all the different types of fields that you have over here on the left, and also all the different best practices for labeling, creating tooltips, adjusting some of these property settings, but we're not going to get into that uh, level of detail today. The one thing I will want to point out is that if you're testing and you want to play around with DocuSign, and we encourage this, start sending envelopes back and forth and testing sending envelopes to each other. And you might want to play with uh, experimenting with some of these fields on the left-hand side to build out your documents. If you want a little bit more documentation or how-to tutorials in the meantime until we go through the template session, this little question mark at the top of the screen is contextual. So if I go ahead and give that a click, it'll actually take me to the corresponding support article in DocuSign on how to add fields to documents. And like I said, it's contextual because I was creating an envelope and I'm adding fields. I'm on the, the field placement page. That's why it took me to this documentation. If we were on the previous screen creating an envelope and we clicked on it, it would give me documentation and little how-to videos on how to create an envelope. Okay. So just always good to know about. And then lastly, once we're ready, we get all the fields placed that we need to. That's when I go ahead and click Send. And then it's off on its way. So you've already seen the signing ceremony. I am going to return there here in just a minute so we can sign as both of these parties again. But I want to point out some other navigational things. So you notice that I've been working off this home 
tab the whole time, clicking the new button, send an envelope. But if you click on the manage tab, you also have a new button right here. And if I click on that, I have all of the same four options. So either screen you're on, it's the identical options. It doesn't matter which screen you press the button on. But you'll notice that when I sent an envelope, it defaulted me here to my sent items. And I was kind of alluding to the fact where your subject line becomes the name of your envelope, much like an email. And the easiest way I like to describe this is kind of think of your manage screen almost like an email interface, where you have an inbox. These are going to be envelopes that might have been sent to you to sign or that maybe you've been carbon copied on. Your sent items are just that. These are envelopes that you have sent and originated and sent to other parties. And of course, you have a draft folder, deleted folder, and then we have some quick views. So if I know, hey, I just want to quickly see, do I have any envelopes expiring soon? I can go ahead and click here, and I'd be able to see if I have any expiring soon. I already have one identified. If I want to quickly see all of my completed transactions that have been signed by all parties, I can click there, and it just filters it out very quickly, or ones that I'm waiting on for others, or maybe ones that are waiting my action. I recommend using these quick views. They're very, very handy, much quicker sometimes than looking through your inbox or sent items. But again, as you can see, the name of your envelope is the subject line, so make sure that it's something unique and memorable so that it's something easily searchable by, or this is going to quickly visually grab your attention. Okay. So let me go ahead and click on this envelope to sign here. Let me delete some of these other notifications. Now notice how the private message that I applied for this recipient in this scenario is kind of separated out from the body message. So this is how the private message would appear, and this is how that hint would appear. So now if I click Review Documents, this is the challenge that I mentioned to you, or rather, this is how we would challenge the recipient that clicked on the link, making sure that they're still the authorized person clicking on it and that their email wasn't hacked and a bad actor is clicking on the link. So if I enter an incorrect access code, try and click validate, it's not going to let me in and I only have a total of three attempts. In this case, I have two more tries before it's going to lock me out. So hopefully I'll get my access code correct this time. Click validate. And then again, this, uh, this, this, this uh, consent right here is for the electronic and record signature, I can't even talk today, electronic record and signature disclosure. This is for e-sign compliance. This is essentially getting your recipient's buy-in, or acknowledgement rather, that they're signing electronically and that their electronic signature holds as much weight and value as their paper-based wet signature would. So they can read the disclosure by clicking on that link and scroll through it, they can download it. But when they're ready, they click the little checkbox and then continue. Now this little pop-up that you're seeing here is called comments. So if I click on add comment, this is a feature typically used if I have a question about a document. So if I'm scrolling through and I'm not sure what I'm signing, I can click right here and I could ask a question and I could address it to the sender or the recipients. So it's kind of like a little quasi instant chat that happens on the side. Don't worry, the chat itself nor this bubble here are going to appear on the final document. It's only visible on the document right now while we're in the signing view. But uh, the comments is something that we typically cover in a more advanced session, so I'm not going to belabor the point on this. just wanted to point out what that pop-up was that you were seeing. Now also some other things in the upper right-hand corner under Other Actions. I could always click Finish Later, and it would save my current progress. So if I have a lot of fields I'm filling out and I need to rush to a meeting, I could always click Finish Later, save my progress, and when I return back to the document later, I would just pick up exactly where I left off. This is that Assign to Someone Else function. So if I click on that, I could basically say, hey, I don't want to sign the document. Instead, I would provide an email address and a name and a reason and that would be the new party that I'm asking to sign instead of myself. I also have the option to decline to sign. And if I click that, it's giving me a warning. You know, did I really mean to finish later or do I truly want to decline signing? Meaning this would void the transaction for all parties. Um, so just be aware of that, that your recipients can decline just in case you see uh, that type of notification come through to you. 
and then I'll go ahead and sign. And then finish. Okay, now before I sign as the next recipient, uh, let me just point out real quick a couple things. First of all, before I navigate away, notice how we automatically sent a notification now to the next recipient. As soon as my first signer, Amanda, finished, now we just notified Steve. So again, you don't have to manually notify people from one person to the next. DocuSign will do that for you. So now if I come back over here to this interface, let me go ahead and refresh my screen. Because as the sender, I want to show you now how you can track that transaction and view what progress is being made on the envelope. So let me click Waiting for Others. Here's that form, or my envelope rather. Click on the name. So this is what we call an envelope detail view. In this detailed view, we can see all the details for this transaction. So we can see who's already completed, who we're currently uh, uh, who is currently the person we're waiting on, and then who's the person downstream that we will be waiting on after the fact. So I can see the green check mark next to Amanda along with the sign date and timestamp. So we already know that she's completed her action. So now we're just waiting on Steve. So showing you some options up here navigationally, let's just say Steve contacted you and says, hey, I never got that email notification. Did you send it to the right email? And maybe you validate it. Yep, it's the right email. You can click resend, and all that does is it re-triggers the email notification to the person you're waiting on. It doesn't notify anybody else who's already signed, nor does it create a new envelope. It's just simply resending the notification to the person you're currently waiting on. You can move it, so you can just simply organize your envelopes into custom folders. I can also correct the envelope. So what if Steve told me the opposite of what I just mentioned? What if he says, oh, wow. Uh, you really messed up, Jesse. You sent it to the wrong email. Oops, sorry about that. I can click Correct. And I can go in and scroll down. Now notice how I can't change the details for Amanda because she's already signed. And because she's already signed both documents, those are locked down. But I have the option of uploading documents. And for the parties that haven't yet signed, I could make corrections. So I could correct Steve's email. I could also add or remove recipients as needed. So let's just say, oops, sorry, Steve, I forgot the one there. And then to complete my correction, I can click Next, finalize it by clicking the word Correct. And now if I view the detail page again, you'll see the new email address reflected. If I click on this More dropdown, let me show you some other options you have. So from time to time, if you send out an envelope, something goes wrong with the transaction. Maybe you sent the wrong document and it's already been signed by the first party and you notice it halfway through and you need to void out the entire transaction and start over. You do have a void option. If we choose that, it will void the envelope, send out notifications to all parties, letting them know that it's been voided. If you void it, you may want to quickly recreate the same transaction and then make some subtle changes or tweaks. And to do that, we can go ahead and just click Create a Copy. And what this does is it basically clones the envelope from scratch from the very beginning. So you can see it pulls in the same documents automatically. All my recipients' names and emails, all the same configurations are in place. Even the fields on the next page are already here on the document. I'm going to go ahead and discard this draft. Let's just return back to the one that I've already started. Now I can also view a history, which is a more granular breakdown of everything that's transpired with this envelope, such as who did I send it to originally, who's already signed. You can see here when I resent the notification. Also, you can see that I corrected the envelope. You can see what the first original email address was, what I corrected it with, and when I completed the correction and then resent the notification to that individual. So it's very, very granular if you need to inspect what's happening with an envelope. So a lot of different options just depending upon what you're looking to do. And then also, finally, we have a download arrow. The document right now is still in process. I haven't got all signatures, so I probably don't want to download it yet. It's up to you. So let me go ahead and quickly finish signing as the final recipient here.
and then I can go ahead and click finish. Okay, so now once you get all signers completed, that's when the envelope is completed, like you saw earlier. And again, here goes that completed notification. So now all parties can view the final copy and save it from their browser. Easiest way that I recommend for you, the sender, to download it would probably be downloading from the web application here. So if I go ahead and just click refresh, you can see the envelope is completed. Both signers are completed. And because the carbon copy came after the last signer, the carbon copy didn't have anything to wait on. We just simply carbon copied the final notification um, at the very end. So now you, the sender, can come over here, click on this download arrow, and then we can choose, do we want to download the documents that were signed, or do we also want to download that certificate of completion? Let me show you the certificate. As a best practice, we always recommend, if you're downloading the documents and storing them in your own file repository, also download a copy of the certificate of completion and store it right next to the signed documents as well. The reason why is because this is your proof that you would show to a judge or attorney if the document made its way to litigation. Maybe someone said, hey, I never signed that electronically. What are you talking about? You would hand this to the litigators, and this would be the evidence chain of how the signatures were collected electronically. So you want to have this supportive evidence right next to the document so that if you fast forward six months from now, six years from now, you still have this evidence just in case you ever need it. But we can see here there's an instant link. It shows me which envelope that this was pertaining to or uh, correlated to. Uh, and then also it shows who the sender was, all those details. But here's all the signing events. So who were the signers? And how were those signatures collected? So if this person, Amanda, said, hey, I never signed electronically. You know, I was sitting in my office in Chicago, but I never signed it. Well, the first question to ask is, okay, well, we sent it to your email address here. Who had, a, who had access to your email? Oh, well, maybe it was hacked. Okay, fair enough. Well, we also see that we had an access code applied to that transaction. How would they have known your secret access code? We didn't communicate it through email, so how would they have known that? Um, so then, and then if you also see we capture an IP address, so maybe that IP address shows the home office location in Chicago. Well, that kind of destroys that argument that it wasn't her because, well, she would have known the access code. It was coming from her home office, so if there was something else fishy going on, that would require a little bit more investigation. But if maybe we didn't have an access code like for this person here, and they say they were in Chicago, and then this IP address maps to somewhere in the Cayman Islands, then maybe we know something uh, is going on that, that shouldn't have happened. You know, Maybe their email was hacked and someone clicked on the link, and because we didn't have authentication, they were allowed right into the document to sign it fraudulently. But you can see here all the different timestamps that are captured. So you get a lot more supportive evidence than you would if, say, someone just signed a document with pen and paper, and fax it over. You have no idea who actually signed the document. All you know is you got a document over the fax machine. And then you can see who's been carbon copied if you had authentication for them as well. And then lastly, legal teams love this, but also a copy of that legal disclosure uh, as it was accepted at the time of signing. Now the last thing I'm going to show you, I've already actually showed you a preview of how a template would be applied. We'll go much more in depth on the template session. But I do also want to point out that we do have reports. So you as an individual users can run reports and you can see all of the envelopes you've ever sent. And you can uh, run, inf run uh, reports such as, you know, how quickly are my documents getting signed? Or which envelopes are still sitting out there that are waiting for signature? If you don't want to view it from the manage view, you can always run a report. In the upper right hand corner, if you click your little picture avatar, the last thing I'm going to show you today is my preferences. So these are your personal login preferences, or rather personal user preferences. So you can update your photo, and as I mentioned and showed you earlier here in those email notifications, your little picture avatar does carry through to the email notifications. So make sure it's something appropriate. Sometimes it's nice putting a face to the name. And then also you can update your company name, job title, etc. You can even come in here to the signatures and you can pre-adopt a signature. So if you know that you're going to be asked to sign documents through DocuSign, go ahead and adopt the signature in advance. 
So that way you just don't have to do it every time you go to sign a document. You basically save it in your profile so when you sign a document it just automatically applies itself. Under privacy and security, we can also choose to display additional information on our ID card to other DocuSign users. Okay. And there's a lot of other settings that uh, really aren't really in scope for this session, but again, you can use this little question mark that is contextual if you want to learn more about your personal preferences. Uh, but the last thing I want to point out here is notifications. So as you saw, you get a lot of email notifications right here when you're the sender and a signer of a document. So if you start getting notifications that really just aren't um, applicable or uh, important to you in your day-to-day, -day, you can always come in here and enable or disable certain notifications. My rule of thumb, though, is that if you've never used DocuSign before, leave them all enabled by default because you really don't know what you don't know. So some of these may be helpful, maybe some not so helpful, but you don't know yet. So leave them enabled, and then over time, if some just are bothersome or not important, then go ahead and disable them at that point. Or defer to your, uh, to your uh, business leaders in terms of uh, what you should or shouldn't be doing here. Okay. All right, so that's DocuSign 101. Uh, we have about five minutes remaining for some additional questions. So if you'd like to either put your question in the chat window if you haven't done so already, or if you'd like to unmute yourselves by clicking that red mic on the right-hand side, uh, feel free to unmute and ask any questions you might have. Hi, um, Jesse. This is Rocio with procurement. Um, the expiration dates, um, can we change them if we need more time um, for a contract to be signed? Yes. You mean after an envelope has already been created? Yes. Absolutely. So if I come over here to my Manage tab, let's just say this envelope that I have already created, I can go ahead and click on that and correct. And if I scroll all the way down, I could click on Advanced Options. And if for some reason I know it's about to expire, I can go ahead and just bump this out however many additional days. You would be adding on to this date, so just be aware of that. Uh, so if I want to add on five additional days, I wouldn't just type in five. I'd have to do 31 plus five. So in this case, adding on five days would be 36. Click Save, Next, and then I'd finalize that correction by clicking Correct. So now I've basically extended the expiration date by five days. So that's how you'd go about it. Great. Um, and another question. So we will be receiving emails as well, right? Then um, these ones on the inbox? I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Would you mind repeating that for me, please? Yeah. If we will receive an email um, to our inbox, rather than um, the ones that right. we're seeing in the portal. So in Outlook, I guess, is there mm -hmm. an email copied to Outlook for the documents that we're sending, or the envelopes that are being created and notices and everything else? Or is mm -hmm. all the management going to happen through this portal, manage portal? Uh, by default, we are going to notify your email address, um, and it's associated with the email address that's tied with your user login. So when, it, when you're a user in DocuSign, you generally log in with an email and password or through email and uh, single sign-on, SSO company credentials. But your username in DocuSign is always going to have your, uh, say, university email address. So when you send an envelope, all those email updates that I was receiving as the sender such as the completed notification, this would be sent to my Outlook as well, to my Outlook inbox. But I could always come in here into DocuSign, click on my Manage tab, and I could track the envelope here as well. So does that help answer your question? It does. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. One more question, Jesse. Um, you know, when you were talking about assigning the, the signature to somebody else, that function, Mm -hmm. Is that somebody else within the organization or, you know, we select anybody that we want to assign that document for signature? Excellent question and a good point of uh, clarification that I didn't add uh, earlier. So when you send an envelope to a recipient, 
Um, so if I just click on new send an envelope. So the name and email that I put here, I could send envelopes to anyone in the world as long as it's a valid email address. So it doesn't have to necessarily be someone internal. Uh, if that were the case, that would be a very, very niche use case um, where I've only seen very few customers do. Um, like if you know that only employees need to sign, for instance, but otherwise, generally speaking, you can send it to anyone in the world. And so to your question, uh, when you reassign it to someone else, the same rule applies. So if I click reassign to someone else, um, I could type in anyone's name, anyone's email, as long as it's a valid email. And then what happens then is I no longer can sign, and instead that new person that I provided the email for, they would get their own email notification, and that link would be embedded and encoded specifically for them, so they would be signing as themselves, not me. Makes sense, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Jesse. This is uh, Pravalika. Hi. So I see that there is an import a bulk list for the recipients. I, I think it is for recipients, right? Correct. So yeah, this... what is the limit for the recipients? Like, is there a limit or is it like for how many ever we want to send? Yeah. Um, if you're talking solely about this import a bulk list, uh, this is actually referring to a feature capability we have in DocuSign called bulk sending. Think of it almost like a mass mailer, like an email merge or a mail merge campaign, where if I have a list of, say, a, up to 1,000 people, that would be the limit, is up to 1,000. So up to 1,000 recipients, I put them all into a CSV spreadsheet and I upload it. Essentially what happens is when I send this envelope, we would send a an, uh, give me a talk. We would send an envelope for however many recipients you have in your CSV file. So if you have like a list of a thousand names and emails, and you click send after you've uploaded that, we're going to create a thousand envelopes, each person getting their own unique transaction. Um, if you're talking about just the limit of adding recipients here by clicking add recipient, add recipient, I've seen some very complex workflows that have over a hundred recipients. Okay. So we can accommodate uh, whatever whatever your workflow needs are. And when we when we do that through the list, so the this this options on the right hand side of the add recipients. So if, if we have different options for different users, then we have to change them manually, or how does that work? Um, I'm not quite sure. I am following the question. So I'm sorry. when we when we Let's say I use import a bulk list, and then I have, let's say, 500 or 600 people that I wanted to send an envelope, right? Mm -hmm. And all of those 600 have, like, different, different options. Some of them need to sign, and some of them need just a copy like that. So oh, would, I gotcha. Mm -hmm. How would that work? You would need to do uh, multiple uh Trans transactions basically, so you'd have different CSV lists and probably different templates. Yeah, so you so if you have one workflow like, hey, these first two people need to sign, then we have a carbon copy, and that only pertains to like 500 people, then you would do a bulk send just to those 500 people using that exact workflow. And then if you have another workflow where you have another 500 people that need to sign, then be carbon copy, then you might have five more signers. Uh, if the workflows change, then you have to go through the sending process separately and have different CSV files set up for those different uh, workflows. And, and if you are and if you are interested in the bulk sending, um, we do have uh, Carrie and I offer a advanced template training, where we go through advanced functionality like document visibility, bulk sending, comments. Um, so that could be something that we demonstrate for you just to help you kind of understand how it works and if it would make sense for certain use cases. Okay. Um, and uh, do you know of any existing clients for DocuSign that uh, that integrates this one with any third-party tools to just save the documents that we received, like that are complete? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we have some uh, out-of-the-box integrations, and we're open source, so we have developers writing integrations, hundreds of integrations all the time. <laughs> uh, ones that we own out of the box that are pretty simple to set up with just a matter of a few clicks is we have like a box integration, SharePoint, Google Drive, um, Salesforce. If you have a, uh, your own listener that you want us to, or endpoint that you want us sending data to, essentially in your uh, DocuSign admin settings, we can configure it to send those completed documents to any of those services to a location of your choice. Uh, but that would probably require a more kind of extensive technical conversation to find out what your requirements are, what you're looking for, what integration, and we can talk about the ins and outs. Okay. okay. But certainly possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, Jesse, there's there is uh, in your community or support site there is a list of those, right? Those uh, out of the box Absolutely. integrations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have one question on the certificates. Um, are those retained? Is there any kind of expiration? How how long those are kept? Excellent question. So the certificates are always retained in DocuSign, no matter what. Okay. Uh, even if you enable purging or retention policy in DocuSign where we purge documents like your PDFs after a certain period of time. We would purge your PDFs and any document level data, but the certificates and the audit trails we hold on to, uh, not only for our audit protection, but also for yours. So if five years from now you came to us and say, hey, we really need the supportive evidence for this envelope ID, we lost it, we can at least provide that. Uh, mm -hmm. if, we've, if you've purged the actual PDF of the document that's got signed, well, we wouldn't be able to provide that, but at least the certificate and the audit trail we would. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, thank you, everyone. Really, really appreciate the engagement and the questions. Um, I have this recorded session, which we will make available um, this afternoon. And actually, uh, Esther, do you, does it matter where we store this? I can uh, download it uh, or upload it, I guess, to either a Google Drive, Dropbox, or Box. And if you just want to, I'm oh, so sorry. sorry. You. Uh, is, is there like a contact person that we could uh, email or give a call regarding um, the power form and knowledge base signatures? Um, you mean how to create power forms? Well, we're we're interested in putting it behind the portal, so we would like some some information. On, on how it all works with the, uh, on the signatures. Uh, yeah, so uh, part of the template training that we go through, uh, it's a two-hour session. The first hour and a half is about templates, but then we dedicate the latter 30 minutes to creating power forms and managing those. Uh, beyond that, we have other advanced ways of using power forms where we can have dedicated sessions where I could walk you through and help you with that. Yeah, Esther, Esther will be coordinating further sessions. We do have, I think, a, a block of hours uh, that we can mm -hmm. allocate uh, for training and different types of sessions. So, Correct. So we'll, we'll coordinate all that. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest in templates and power forms too. So, yeah, for this case, um, if we can get with uh, – Esther, and, and make sure that we have the appropriate folks in your area attending the upcoming classes. Uh, Esther really has the uh, the upcoming schedule of how we plan to roll this out. So uh, yes. we can just get with, yeah. And, and I'm sorry, who was that speaking? Uh, I only see EPC as the identification. Who, who is that? Hi, this is Evelyn, and I'm from the financial aid office. Okay. Yes, Evelyn. Let's uh, let's talk because we do have a a uh, plan. Well, we're working on putting together a plan, and so um, I'll uh, I'll add you to the stakeholder risk uh, list that I have, and then um, uh, send you information about the upcoming sessions. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. 
And, and just to confirm, you have a 50 hour professional services work order that Jesse and I are working off of. Um, this was your first introduction to DocuSign. <clears throat> the next session is the template creation power form as Jesse indicated. And it's where we start really getting into the meat of how to get an, an effective return on investment, how to make uh, your draft, uh, create draft envelopes, and then how you can turn those into power forms too. And from there, then we can schedule working sessions on a more uh, individual basis or group basis so that you learn how to create the templates and power forms and each of you has your own workflow type thing. But that's, um, I can work with Esther mm -hmm. on all of that and sounds like she has a plan. So, um, so we're available for, for okay. all of that. Okay, does that answer all of your questions? or at least initial questions? Sounds like it, thank you. Okay, then we will, um, I'm gonna conclude this, and then Esther, if you just wanna let me know where to um, put this recorded session, mm -hmm. I'll get that up and send a link to you. Okay, we'll carry, thank you. Perfect, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, talk to you later, bye-bye. Have a great weekend. You too. You too.